Gentlemen, I am BDLM coming to you with my buddy J4Y, bringing you episode number 57 of our Dota on the Man podcast. What's going on, man? Episode 57, uh, two and a half weeks later. So, you know, I think it's like literally after we just said, let's do this weekly. Uh, we decided to not do it weekly, but unfortunately, once again, real life has won out. But we do like to get back on track and on schedule and... Uh, sometimes it's almost a good thing for you as listeners because it lets us build up more content so it's not like that weird, uncomfortable kind of filler talk. Like, you know when you're in an elevator and you're just like, you see the person, you're like, I don't really want to talk to this person at all. But you have to say something because you made eye contact, so you're like, what nice weather out there. And they're like, yeah. And that's all. And it's say. raining, and then you feel retarded because you didn't realize <laughs> that it was raining out and you said it was nice weather. And then, and then your whole your whole cover's blown. <laughs> just awful. forget it. And now you got like three more floors to go with this person, and just forget it. And, and then, then is, the, the fire alarm goes weird. off. The elevator's stuck in the shaft, and you're you're screwed. Forget this, it. And uh, the security realizes that you're not supposed to be in there anyway. And then, uh, but anyway, that's probably what happened. <laughs> yes, never happened ever. Uh, episode number fifty-seven. It's got a lot of small random bits that we're gonna weave together, but it's going to be real nice. We're going to talk about some of the roster changes that come after the International. We're going to talk about the patch that hit that wound up uh, putting four new heroes in the Captain's mode. We're also going to talk about some uh, nice hero comparison. We're going to go to some viewer stuff and give uh, some people some shout-outs. And then also, uh, just as a, a nice little thing to sort of piggyback what you are saying about us having a little hiatus, um, we, we took our time to sort of draft a whole bunch of future episodes so actually we're going to try and put out one very quickly after this one so that there's a you know something to sort of uh, appease the fans um, about watching Dota and what kind of stuff to really be looking for if you're trying to learn the game and, and take things away from it so it, it should be a good week for uh, us here at Dota on the Man and you guys out there as listeners and so here we go I mean I think the first thing we want to do is uh, talk about our buddy Scott how about our Scott as well as just the three in general? I I I love to give you guys credit and shout outs. Uh, and I'm going to be doing it probably weekly until we get to the AC threshold point where I just just do not have enough time to name off all of your names. And if we get to that point, we'll be happy men over here. So please get us to that point where I just get give up on like number 105 and like you know what, Mister. Zamboni 23. You know what? Forget it. You just go back to the hockey ring because I don't care. I'll never get to that point. But, anyways, tangent over. Uh, thanks for Mobius once again. Mr. Mobius coming back and us a nice little comment. As well as Ragnarok Chaos and then Scott Balfour. Uh, new in town as far as I'm concerned. I haven't seen him around. But thanks for all the, pos uh, the posts. And Scott in particular. Uh, Left a pretty lengthy one, actually, and asked a few questions, or at least had three kind of mini topics. Did you want me to just re briefly read them, or do you want to? Absolutely. Okay. So, apparently he listened to the most recent episode, which is good. And <laughs> it's a good start. Uh, and uh, this is in regards to our episode 56, our last one, where we talked about TI3. Uh, and he, the first part point he brought up is he said, Havorst, you said, was on Alchemist all the time, which he did a lot, but through the prelims, he was a hyper-aggressive weaver, which led to being banned a lot from, like, Lifestealer. So... Fact, he he, do, he definitely was, and I think we spent a lot more time on that episode, and obviously the later parts of the playoffs. Because I mean, if we tried to talk about <laughs> every single game that went on in the qual, I mean, it would have been that would have probably been a huge episode just for the, the 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 prelims, and then one for like the play. I mean, you could have made that three or four episodes easy, but definitely a good point you bring about how his Weaver was just nasty. I mean, that was something that as we were watching it too, like. When just seeing Weaver all over the place, and and one of our friends uh, even asked like, what did they do to Weaver that he's getting picked up all of a sudden? It's like, nothing. He's just awesome, and people were picking him a lot, especially in those early stages. And yeah, I called out a lot of bands um, through the later part of the tournament, which um, I, it was really nice to see him because again, it's just one of those things I think you sort of expect to see, or at least that I expect to see out of the international sort of these. Heroes are things that may have disappeared that you could just sort of see again and be like, oh yeah, that's that's awesome, that's great. And to be able to see Weaver do that, it's great. And of course now, after the International, he's still this hero that will pop up once in a while uh, to get to see, which is awesome. His uh, Scott's next question, um, 
was the about our Timbersol mid discussion, where you like sort of point out because we at the time were like Timbersol mid, hmm. and uh, you know he he said mid he gets a level advantage on other lanes, which gives him a huge leg up with the spammable nukes and uh, skirmishes to start, and it's a uh, relatively safe for him. And I think those are valid points. And the other thing I think is interesting too, which uh, sort of going off of Scott's thing was just thinking about how he compares to some other of like heroes that function in a similar way and the one that sort of popped into my head was Storm Spirit. You have this hero that doesn't really have an escape before level 6 because obviously his ultimate is a great escape. Um, but sort of similarly Timbersaw doesn't have a ton of trees to go to so they're both kind of sitting ducks in a certain, to a certain extent. They can do a lot of close burst damage um, and I think it, it's sort of interesting because Storm Spirit is really susceptible to the early ganks, and you would think Timbersaw the same way. But Timbersaw actually winds up having higher strength, higher strength gain, and then also has reactive armor that you're putting points into. And so it, it's kind of interesting to compare those two just because you have this Timbersaw who's sort of in the same position of Storm Spirit, but built to handle it better. So I think if, obviously, you're going to have situations where you want the Storm Spirit more, but it's interesting to sort of be able to juxtapose a hero that's sort of almost always been part of the metagame from when there were you know just a handful of heroes to now um, with this sort of new hero come into it make this big splash uh, at a major tournament. Yeah I mean I think when I was originally trying to make the argument for not putting him middle I was always I was still in the mindset of having him built skill wise at least the way I have in the side lanes like for example you maxed out your timber chain and you would just do crazy four second bursts of damage with it and move around the map like a madman whereas obviously in middle you go a completely different build you max out that Q and get your armor up as well maybe one or two points and uh, just tank up the lane and get that farm like Scott was kind of saying and uh, I really underestimated the damage of Q I think when you get the tree factor involved and get that pure damage up uh, and like he's saying, you know, you get those early levels, well that's just perfect timing. As soon as you get maybe a good rune or something to pop up, you can easily gank a side lane once you hit 6. It's it's ridiculously strong with uh, the Chakram and whatnot. Um, and also getting the, or the farm is another great point to bring up, just because if you don't run him in middle, you're obviously not going to put him in your, your carry short, short lane, so obviously the only other spot he'll be is side lane, and that's going to be a challenge for him. I mean, he can escape to a degree, but obviously until you max out that chain, your distance you can go is relatively small, and uh, it's also, you don't have the mana to support it early on either, so uh, yeah, obviously middle is his best spot to get pretty easy farm, and with the Q, you don't have to worry about last hitting necessarily against other people um, because you can just do nice AoE damage, so I, I, all those obviously, I think, very good points. And I let's agree. just say also, I was converted because we played Captain's Mode, and I do like him in that role now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a lot of fun there. Um, and and uh, Scott's last thing was rumor TI3 in China. I thought the... Uh, oh, yeah. I I mean... I... I, I, I I'm kind of wondering what I'm thinking about for 4. Um, I think I've already seen some stuff like, oh, now 4 is going to be in China. Like, uh, Whatever. I mean, I feel like it could just as easily still be in Seattle. I kind of hope it is, because it's a little bit shorter flight. But, um, obviously that's a long time away, so maybe we'll leave the rumor mill spinning. I think he meant TI4. Yeah. Due to the fact that TI3 had passed when we did this episode, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he meant that, but, but yeah. Uh, it would obviously, it would make a lot of sense if they could do it maybe not necessarily in China, but at least somewhere in the Asian, uh, Southeast Asian region, just because of how at least half the teams are coming from that area. So, I mean, it definitely could happen, but let us Americans be selfish and greedy for another year and, and at least hope for one more in the States. <laughs> I think, I figure too, like, of all the places that you really have to grow esports, I think between the three major regions, North America is, I think, the, the weakest. And so it's kind of nice if you're able to host it in not only where your company headquarters is, but then also in the place where esports maybe has the most room for growth. So it, it's kind of interesting. I, I could see arguments going both ways about it, and I'm sure it's something that they discuss, um, you know, once they're making the plans for it. But like I said, I'm, I'm hoping for that short plane ticket. <laughs> yeah, let's let's spend less than five hundred fifty dollars for this next one. That'd be. I mean, I guess worst right. case scenario, we can just drive, and I mean that would only take like like it. <laughs> well, some people have West East Coast, so 
What's wrong with Forrest us? Forrest Gump it? ran it, didn't he? I oh mean, yeah, that's... yeah. That was a, based on a, a true story. I'm pretty sure they made up. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, uh, uh, th thanks, Scott, for the questions. And I and like we kind of always say, but in general, if you guys have any questions or comments, please leave them. We, we obviously like to respond to them. We're kind of almost. Uh, we love to gobble them up, so we're always looking for them. So uh, feel free to drop them whenever, wherever. Well, somewhere we can see them. Uh, so now going to, uh, uh, and let's, I think that's all we can say about that. Uh, going into these roster changes real quick. We don't obviously have to go into all of them because some of these people or teams you won't even really recognize. So we'll kind of go over the big ones, I guess. Um, and we just have to start with, I think, the most popular of all of Dota 2 is this new DK reroll shift that has uh, three new members previously uh, it was all team China now it's a mixture of three different countries and it's uh, looking fantastic so Lanham from Rattlesnake if you remember him uh, Mushi from Orange I think that name should be uh, rattling around people's brains after TI3 and then uh, Ice 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 if anyone's heard of him before uh, I don't know if you you might have been uh, the solo mid tournament perhaps I, I don't know where you would have heard of this guy but uh, all three of them head to Team DK from their previous team. So now, like I said, not all Chinese, but they have a lot of not only popular players, but really good ones. And the, the other, the quick comment I just want to say before you get into it is that you're, some people be like, Mushi and Isis Ice on the same team? Well, what's going on there? Like, aren't they both strong mid players? I'm not really getting it. Uh, Ice Ice Ice, if you've ever watched his stream, can play any role exceptionally well. So... It's a good sign of a good player is he can do multiple things. So actually a lot of people are already predicting him maybe even going side lane, but hey, who knows how they're going to work it out. I'm just excited as hell to see it. Yeah, and I mean, I think the other thing that's sort of neat about this team is that, I mean, obviously I think all of these names are, are really well known. And I mean, uh, Rattlesnakes performed probably the, the least of any of the teams that any of these players are coming from. But the fact that I just remember watching their sort of um, the little snippet of their lead in, and they're like, "Yeah, we don't have a manager. We kind of just got here because we're good." And it's kind of neat to to have a player come um, from a team like that that doesn't have a manager. They might not have somebody who's just you know sitting there and trying to help them tweak and improve their games. And now they're going to be on this you know world renowned squad, um, you know, playing for this esports club that, you know, has been around for a, a long time now. So he'll have, they'll have that support to be able to help grow their individual players. And of course, they're coming together now. If they're able to stick together, obviously in a year's time, they're going to be, you know, uh, a great organized team. Oh, it's just exciting. And, you know, it, 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 it's, it's also because I think of the popular players that maybe I'm getting a little overhyped than I might should be. I mean, it's obviously going to be a strong, but they're going to have to get coordinated. Now, I think one of the things that when we were originally talking about it was how there could be some language barrier issues up front with the team. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a Chinese, a Malaysian, and uh, oh my god, what the hell is this flag? Singapore. Uh, Singapore. You got I don't it. Know which Ice 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 is Singapore, so it's all good. Sorry, I, I you know, flags and me do not get along. I need to listen to Sheldon on Big Bang Theory. He's got a nice little uh, YouTube series on it, I heard. You haven't seen that show, it's fine. Other people get the reference. Anyways, uh, so three different countries. Yeah, maybe some uh, English might have to tie it all together, unless these people know <laughs> other languages, uh, perhaps. Maybe they'll all speak Swedish and I'll be surprised. Hell, I don't know. Whatever works for them. But at the end of the day, I think the language thing will become less of an issue when they more just get comfortable playing with each other, knowing each other's styles. And the great thing is these new players, well, at least Mushi and Ice Ice Ice, they're kind of in solo roles, if assuming if I'm calling their, their new lane positions correctly in the side lane and mid. So, I mean, yeah, communication is very important, but at least you're not, like, constantly in a tri-lane with these new people and, like, trying to figure things out and, like, getting confused and work, you know. So I think it, I honestly don't expect it to be too hard of a transition for them. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely excited. I mean, I, I've never really been a huge fan of like any particular Asian team but this DK squad is actually one that I really want to try and follow and, and keep on top of and I mean the the other big roster change for me is the fact that there isn't a roster change uh, oh, yeah. because there was so much flying around the Twitters about <laughs> it uh, Navi's staying together and I, I will admit to being a Navi fanboy 
And I'm actually, like, in talking about the DK Switch, and it's like, oh yeah, these guys are coming together soon after um, the International, so they have time to get prepared. If Navi's able to stick together the whole year, then they, they'll have, as a unit, for the first time, unless I'm getting my timeline confused, um, the same team at multiple internationals, like the whole team, which is great. Obviously, um, you know they also just got invited to EMS uh, one, so it, it's they're getting right back into the swing of things, and so I, I'm really excited to see there being a team that's able to perform well that has, of course, their the three players that now are left sort of having this Navi Dota 2 legacy, but now they're going to have this, hopefully, core lineup that's going to be able to move forward in the next, you know, year season of Dota, and try and recreate and improve upon their fantastic results. Yeah, let's just hope that Dendi doesn't retire with all this money he's made in the esports. I mean, he should at least pump out another couple of years before he goes buying his beach house in some island somewhere. Uh, which he probably already has one, God knows. But uh, Or he still lives in the mod's basement and is just saving it up for a rainy day. He, either way, it could be happening, but uh, I doubt that one. Uh, and then uh, I think the third and final rush... By the way, just want to say, Havorst was just being a drama queen. That's all that really was. And people just took it way too far. It was literally a Twitter post that people just blew up to be more. And, it, and I think he, he apologized to his team and to everyone else, saying it was the emotions running high and... You know, he said sorry to them all and that, you know, he was glad that he could resolve the issues. And now they're, like, taking a week vacation. And I also love, by the way, how the esports media, they d it's just like every other media, I swear to God, how their headline was something like, the team is no longer playing with Havorst, and then the first one's like, for one week or something, because he's going on vacation. So, like, the headline's like this, like, <gasps> what? And then it's like, Oh, you sons of bitches. You just made me pay the 25 cents to buy this newspaper, didn't you? Like, <laughs> it's just one of those stupid things, but uh, it was yeah. pretty good. I'm definitely glad they're all staying together, though, because I I, I like it. I like I like uh, seeing that continued. The final thing. change, uh, it's, it's uh, oh. uh, Invict IG and Tong Fu had a little switcheroo. Uh, Zhu went over, or Zhao, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Zhao. <laughs> Zhao. You know what? You're the Southeast Asian expert at our team, so have fun with Apparently. that. Uh, Zhao, going over to Tong Fu, and Hao, <laughs> did I pronounce that one right? God, I hope, uh, went over to IG. So they did a little switcheroo. And basically, the moral story with that one is uh, the team, uh, I guess the management for IG, uh, said Zhao wasn't playing up to par, and they, they, they felt like he needed to move on. So he originally dropped... They looked to pick up Hao, who I guess was looking to join, and then I guess Tong Fu's like, well, shit, we need a hero, a player now. They're like, hey, I heard you're a free agent. Come on in. No, it's not exactly how it went, I'm sure, but, you know, more, more or less, that's, they just did a little switch, so. Uh, we'll see how, I guess, that transition. It shouldn't be too crazy, since they're all Chinese people doing Chinese things over there, but I think it'll be good. Yeah, uh, we, following the International, there were some nice smaller tournaments, which I actually kind of enjoyed getting to watch. Um, some smaller ones. The one that I was actually really excited about uh, that wound up breaking my soul was uh, I-49, if anybody had uh, been following up that one. It was a, a UK tournament. It was like supposed to be their first big one, and I think the production value was about the lowest oh. ever. There was a point where uh, there was about a 10-minute part of a game where they had their uh, splash screen up. Oh, you couldn't see no. anything. There was some points where the caster was talking about his drive home the next day and how the traffic was going to be. And so, you know, but what I did take away from watching the other small tournament, which I can't remember the name of, and it was even in a different language. It wasn't even English, but I was like, this is just by far better. Um, Disruptor was actually apparently... Oh, becoming really popular for really clicky for a while um, being picked up and I saw a second pick Earthshaker twice which I thought was just great because th here's this hero that you hardly ever get to see um, you know amongst the tier 1 tier 2 teams and then he's just so highly prized by great players you know that maybe just aren't up on that level but it was just so cool to get to see um, that sort of level of captain's mode of, of these people being able to really just pick whatever works really well for them, pick what heroes they really like, 
And, I mean, we actually, uh, we started a Captain's Mode team. And, uh, Jay, you're welcome to fill in everybody on that. But, um, it, we, we may, may have lost to, to such a strategy of we, we pick what we want. Yeah, there was a few games that went kind of unfortunate uh, in our favor. Actually, I'd say pretty much all the uh, placement matches, if you will. I, I can't remember, was it three that we had to do before we got placed? Yeah, it was three placement matches, and uh, all three happened to be against the same team. And uh, you would think you'd mix it up a bit, but so you could actually tell how good you are. But no, apparently, if you play this one team three times, and you lose them all three times... It means you're ranked like 4,000, which is what we ended up being. But the team name, uh, I'll say it and then I'll explain it real quick. Uh, Dota by Candlelight is uh, how you'll notice. You'd be like, yeah, what, what, not Dota on Demand, like the, the Sprocketeers or something? I, I don't know, like some crazy, I don't know where that name came from, but it could have been. Uh, but no, we're not the Dota on Demand years or something. We're, we're just Dota by Candlelight. And uh, I got it. I was out with my girlfriend. And sorry, folks, I'm, I'm taken. So, if you stop mm. listening now, um, BDLM's still here. So, for now, get on it while he's still in the market. Just say it. Hurry up. But, um, I was out with the girl, and, uh, <laughs> one of our friends, uh, if you know Dunn, if you've ever seen us play with him or cast with him or anything, uh, he sent me a message saying, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, you know, just out, hanging out. And he's like, are you coming back tonight to play? Because he's been, he's been on a Dota spree with us, right? And I'm like, no, nah, I think I'm going to be out all night. And he's like, and then he sends me this picture message. And it's a picture of his two monitors, Dota on one, some something else on the other one, I don't know what was on the other one. And there was this little, it was in the dark, there was this, this little candle right in between the monitors, and it said, Miss You. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> at first I didn't know what to think, because I was just, I was just stunned that that happened. But um, apparently it's become now a trend with our friends to just start playing by candlelight. Apparently we have superpowers when we do it as such. Um, so that is where we decided to derive the name from, and uh, now you have it. We are we are Dota by candlelight. Yes, I have to say, uh, first and foremost, that that picture will be on Facebook. <laughs> um, and so you all will have to stop by there, facebook.com slash Dota on Demand to check that out, because it's, it's a gem. It's, it's just... Mm. Perfect. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, we lost to a sniper first pick, but that's not the important part. The important part is that we learned a lot about ourselves and captain's mode in general, and it was really good. Um, we did lose to one team three times in a row in our place match. We did win a game though, and that's what that's matters. What matters. Most. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a complete slaughter. Um, and it, well, it was sniper first pick. He went mid, and then they had Drow. So um, runner side lane. They had a lot of range damage. In fact, I think all five heroes might have been ranged or something. It was a, uh, it was actually a really strong team comp when they threw it together. Um, but they were also just they're more coordinated, and that's something when you play these CM matches. If you ever get to play with five, four of your friends, you learn a lot about synergy and communication. Definitely communication um, and map presence awareness. Uh, just being able to look around and help each other out because. What you think you know about teamwork and everything, you really don't until you actually get into it. And this is a great little, again, uh, teaser for our, right. our next episode, which is really just sort of about trying to pick up on these things and realizing what's important. I haven't actually had a chance to go back and watch our Captain's Mode games yet, but it's definitely something I know I'm going to be doing to look, and, and maybe we'll even have some stuff to, to put up in the next um, episode. But for maybe the more uh, reasonable Captain's Mode, we, we also had the arrival of Elder Titan, uh, Centaur Warchief, Abaddon, and Troll Warlord. And I'll just say, before you get to put in your two cents, Jay, that I am just so thrilled to just have gotten to see not just all of these heroes picked or banned up to this point, but one game where three of the four were actually relevant to the picks and the bans. Yes, and it wasn't even Kai P playing, which is just no. a miracle there too. I mean, you're like, oh yeah, of course, Kai P probably picked three of them. I'm sure that happens, but but no, it wasn't just them trolling around. It was uh, other teams finding use for these. And actually, uh, I don't know how much you want to go into the one game in particular, but there was one where Troll was one, or played, excuse me, and he's he's played middle very often. But um, essentially, I was looking around on his team, and I'm like, 
why do they pick Troll? There's no one on his team that's going to benefit from his ulti, really, except for him. And I'm like, I was sitting there confused, and you're like, that they just chose him because he's a good hero. And I was like, oh, that's oh, yeah. awesome! <laughs> like, that's such good news for that hero. <laughs> he's not a gimmick. <laughs> it's actually something I wanted to talk about in general, because I think one of the neat things about seeing them and of course, you know, we like to talk about them and just from our experiences with them and maybe from seeing them in the past. But I think a lot of these heroes, you and I haven't really gotten to see it in a professional capacity um, because we never really kept up with the professional Dota 1 scene a whole lot. Um, and so just to sort of see our expectations of these heroes get placed up against sort of the neat little combos. Like the, when you were saying, yeah, the Troll Warlord, he didn't really have anybody that he coupled like crazy well with. I know you've said that you've seen him a lot with like an OD or something, someone who can really put out a lot of auto attack damage. There was a gyrocopter on the team, so speeding up the flat cannon, I think it's like a good link up. But the I think my favorite part was actually getting to see um, in this Empire versus Virtus Pro game, which actually was played tonight. Um, Abaddon, Troll Warlord, Gyrocopter on the same team. Gyrocopter gets ganked. It's it's a doozy. Alright. Storm Spirit does his thing, jumps in, Nature's Prophet, teleports in, has nakes inside of him. That oh should God. be a relatively je dead gyrocopter. Drops call down, and, and Abaddon's there. Shield, heal, and then Fleck, uh, the, uh, the call down actually hits, and gyrocopter gets a triple kill. They're <laughs> 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 just like, holy crap. The great thing about the Abaddon, too, is it's not just like... I mean, obviously, you think about this stuff as like the heal and the shield, and that's great, you're keeping somebody alive, but just the time that they were able to buy Gyrocopter because he drops call down directly on top of himself. He's like, we can do this if you really want to. And they did, and they paid for it dearly in that situation. And um, I, there have just been a couple others. The, the other one that I really enjoyed was Naga Siren and the Elder Titan together because, yup, that's hilarious to have at the Roche Pit. Um, I'm trying to see if I have the name written down for the game that I was in. I don't think I did because I'm really good was at that it the sort Wombo of thing. the Wombo Comboers versus someone? <laughs> it, yeah, it should have been. <laughs> um, just those two heroes together were able to pick up one kill and severely damage the other team, and it was... It was phenomenal. Did you right? watch? How much of that game did you watch? Did you hmm. see where Elder Titan laned? No, I didn't. See, that's something I'm still curious about. I mean, I, I figure maybe middle is his best bet, or as a support, possibly in a tri lane or something, but... I mean, God knows. I Off lane, I would say, is probably the one place I wouldn't put him, of all the positions, but... Menace versus Empire, and both of these games were in Starlighter Season 7. Hmm. So I can give you that much. But uh, no, and I don't remember the rest of the team either to tell you where he was probably at. But well, hopefully we'll see him more, and then it will become less of a question mark and more of a reality. But, uh, I mean, this is... I mean, I, I probably said this about six times now about this hero, but gods, I just remember him saying how huge he was in the Southeast Asian scene um, back in Dota 1. So I I figure once, now these in cabin modes and teams maybe are going to start practicing with them in scrims and stuff, that we'll start seeing them come out in these torrents. Now, the torrents we're watching uh, at this time are definitely countries all over the world, so it's not as much focus on Southeast Asia. But um, and in fact, actually, there's a North American tournament going on actually right now, uh, starting tonight, or maybe it started a couple days ago with Mott and NY John that were uh, hosting it for Neo Dota. But um, that's cool too. Now, granted, these teams, uh, I don't actually think it, it might not even involve Liquid or EG. I'm not exactly sure if they're even playing in it right now because of all the roster things and craziness going on there. But give some love into the North American team. Sure, uh, you know, we're maybe a little behind on the eight ball and skill and well knownness. Oh, that was horrible. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> but, um,. You know, the more we have these kind of events, the the better chance we have to get ourselves out there and uh, get ourselves a shot to have more than just two teams there uh, at every TI... whatever. You know what I mean? Like yes. More, more America. We need more America in these tournaments. Damn it. Yes. Uh, I want to say, and you're welcome to correct me, I seem to remember at TI2 there being a lot of USA chanting for Na'Vi. 
<laughs> so we're in need of these home teams because they we're are our gonna... home team. Let's be honest. I mean, we cheer for Liquid and we cheer for Dignitas, even though Dignitas is half Canadian. But let's not get into that. Uh, th that it's it's America's hat. There are there are a little hat. So I mean, that's a pretty big hat actually. But uh, yeah, we we, we we do kind of uh, embrace Navi as, as soon as the American teams get eliminated. We're like, screw it, Navi. That's our team now. We're good. New it is funny that they say USA during it because it's who knows why, but that's just what we do. That's what because we do. We can. Because we can. <laughs> we take it as our own. That's the American way. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I uh, I, I have been excited for. Uh, I haven't gotten to see Nellar Titan play personally, uh, so maybe I'll go back and watch those games after this. And uh, the Abaddon, I just got to see some glimpses of that in the pro games you were talking about. I was watching a little bit myself, but the Troll Warlord's the one I've seen the most so far. I've seen most of it played by Kai P because for some reason every time I turn one of these streams on, Kai P is playing. I don't know why, but that just seems to be the case. So that's good. I think they're so much fun to watch. So they you got that. are. They are indeed. They're. They're. I wouldn't go to say they're one of the top tier teams at this point, but they're. They're not bad. They're pretty good, and uh, I think they're just improving now. That their roster is starting to get a little more stable. Um, but you know, they they love to run these unconventional heroes. They're the ones that kind of start rub uh, brushing the dust off Spirit Breaker as a as a hero as a usable support, and uh, you know I just love to see what more they can do with these kind of heroes. So I expect them to be running these other three like they do the Troll Warlord very frequently. Well, not very frequently, but some sometimes. Yeah, I mean I remember um, in talking about some watching some of the smaller tournaments like uh, I forty nine, Abaddon was uh, just sort of like everybody was like, yeah, no, we're not gonna just take him out. We don't want to play with them. They came out like the day before, um, but in the other one he was available and um, saw some success, saw some failure, and I even like that better to be honest with you. Liking to see these heroes come in as sort of a mixed bag, not all or nothing. Because then it almost feels like it's more legitimate. If you're winning every game, then clearly people just haven't figured it out. If you're losing every game, then people aren't going to pick it because they're trying to win. So it's it's nice to get to see them come in and then have this sort of, like I said, mixed bag, this decent distribution between wins and losses. Now, why, why if Abaddon can start getting popular, why can't Omni Knight make a comeback? We can dream. I mean... They're, I mean, yeah, obviously there's big differences in the hero, but mm -hmm. essentially they both provide are heavy supporters for their teammates. And in fact, you would definitely say Omni Knight's ultimate. Is, uh, Omni Knight might be a better team fight hero in general just because of his ultimate. Um, but and then with his Ogonims, you can heal towers, so whatever. But uh, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> still haven't seen that. Would love to see that. I don't know how or when that would ever be used, but screw it, they gotta do it. Oh. BDL apparently next CM is what what I'm mm -hmm. being told. I, I've just got just got the word in, but um, uh, yeah, I I don't know. I just feel like they're very similar in a fashion. So I feel like if we can see Abaddon getting used in games, then Omni Knight should have a pretty decent chance himself to get in here somewhere. Yeah, I'd certainly like to see it. He actually has a better win percentage than I thought he would. It's forty forty nine percent. That's pretty. That's right. That'll do. That'll do. I'll take it. But yeah, for now, unfortunately, it's uh, it's the Abaddon. These new heroes being the flavor of the week. I haven't gotten to see a Centaur game yet. I've seen him banned, but I have not seen him pick. He's got to go mid. He's just got to, just because I love him <laughs> mid. I know you want to use him in a tri lane because you love him as a support, but uh, but uh, he could even jungle. It would be a painful jungle. He would have to go through like four salves or something. I don't know how he would keep it up, but that double edge AoE is so strong. I remember playing a, a casual game with someone and I was I was playing support sent oh it was when B when Dumb was playing Drow. We were a Drow Centaur off lane, which was just not the best against the tri lane in general. But at around level three when we died for like the sixth time in a row or something, I was like, you know what? Screw this and I just went over with my Trank boots and started jungling. And I just got levels of gold fast. Like stacked up the creeps and just jungled my butt off. And before you knew it, within 10 minutes, I probably had like a blink and I had all this other stuff. I was like, yeah, here I am. Time to fight. And uh, he's one of those here. Because of that double edge AOE change that he did patches and patches back, that, I honestly believe, is what made him now competitive. Yeah, I mean, it's just so much damage. Um, they took the mini sun off of it, which is fair. Yeah. But, I mean, I even still really like the alt, even though, obviously, that was a little uh, unfair before. Um, <laughs> it's, it's still, uh, I think, a great ability. And it's... You know, I haven't gotten to see it yet in the professional play, but uh, ban worthy apparently. So that's it's good just to 
sort of see him get his hat in the ring. What was he like? Wasn't he like an 80% win rate in pubs or something when that first release of that alt came out or something? It was, it was, it was really retarded. It was a tiny it was cooldown. Really it was like a 60 second cooldown stud. It was just an OP. There was no way it could stay mm -hmm. that way. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's what you, you've got to figure it out. And thankfully, it wasn't in pubs because, you know what, worst case scenario, a lot of unhappy people in games until they got to pick them for themselves. But yeah, I think the main reason I love it so much, I mean, yeah, it's it's good to have the moves being the slow and everything, but it's global. That's my favorite part of it is that you can just, you pop it and save someone across the map and uh, you don't have to even be there for it. So uh, very, very, I, I know I, I personally, when I play, I'm saved a whole bunch of people just because I have map awareness, not necessarily everyone else in the game does, but, you know, if you can be, be aware of those kind of things, you can make some big plays without even being there. So uh, I want to say about the troll lineup because you mentioned it. Uh, I wanted to briefly go off what I thought would be an amazing troll lineup. Uh, and I believe we tried something similar to this and it ah, did not work the way we Just wanted it to. Less than reputable. Well, less than reputable is the way to... And I think it's because the people we played with weren't so comfortable in those positions. But the way I, I would enjoy it, uh, of course you run that troll. Uh, he, he's kind of a staple. And then you get uh, the Outworld Devourer for those odd attacks, like you were saying, and then Enchantress in the jungle. Um, Silencer, possibly as a support, if you want, with his orb well, effect. You're I'm going, going ham. I'm going ham here. Uh, that, uh, uh, I guess offlane, uh, I could be boring and say Nature's Prophet. I mean, I don't know of much better for that. I mean, you could say Windrunner too, but... You're not. You're kind of limited on the offlane there. I, I don't know. Do whatever you want there. In Clint. fact, you might actually just want to go like Clockwork or something and just get Initiation because that team's pretty awful otherwise. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, you just go Clinks and everyone dies. Oh God, there it is. Clinks is beautiful. Now that'll work just great. So <laughs> Searing Arrow. T oh my God, yes, there it is. So there's your team. I mean, th and this is where we were going back to the thing about gimmicky. Th this is where you just take full advantage of this hero being. His ultimate being ridiculously strong and, and such a low cooldown, and he kind of is in the same vein as the centaur in, in regards to a global ulti. That he could be doing something in the jungle, he could be in a side lane, doesn't matter where he is. But your team could be like Clinks could be in this bottom lane, pushing the tower, pop that troll ulti. That tower's gone before you know it, and it's just like such a strong ability overall. So I don't know. I I, I think at least one other strong auto attacker should probably be used with him, but obviously it's been proven that that's not a necessity. He's just a good hero in general. Yeah, I mean, I, I still think the gyrocopter takes advantage of it with the flat cannon, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't think you need a whole lot. And he's proven to be really strong in the, in the middle lane, and the thing I find most interesting about that is starting with a poor man shield. Yeah. It seems to be pretty standard, and I wouldn't have necessarily guessed that. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely wouldn't have. I mean, <clears throat> obviously, if you if you people who are listening have played him, because uh, he's actually he's not the simplest hero to play, really. I mean, the old way he was, yeah, you just auto attacked and you won. This new way, you've got to actually switch forms to really maximize your damage output and your your all your abilities together. Um, it's really about going into melee and using those whirling axes though around to do your most damage, um, but you know. The, the poor man's shield just works so effectively because a lot of times you're against a ranged hero when you're in that lane. And you're going to be going, uh, you're going to be having trouble last hitting with that attack point unless you go into melee, which he gets more damage with, by the way, if you didn't know that. So, um, obviously, you're going to be in melee a lot. It's, you, you're safe to farm creeps with that poor man's shield. You can get up in their face and harass them and you're not going to be taking too much damage. And then Bottle, I believe, is just a nice popular pickup after that poor man's to really, you could argue that one, but I like the bottle there. You, I mean, your spells are pretty negligible mana costs, but you could, it's a really short cooldown, I think, for his melee one. So you could just keep going to town, farming creeps, going to the jungle, farm them as well. Pretty simple. I mean, the other thing, too, is you're, you pretty much have to run into melee range of the creeps in order to get your, your whirling axes to hit a ranged hero for the melee form, so you're going to be getting the damage from the creeps, you're going to be able to block the poor man shield, so it actually makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, it's really nice. And I mean, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. The, he has a really small int gain, really small amount of int in the first place, so um, I like the 
getting the Aquila on him, I think it's actually a pretty nice choice, but... Yeah, it's... He's definitely neat. I've seen him built several different ways, and I definitely like that about him as a hero, too. Obviously, I think the BKB is really important, but a lot of other items surrounding that, and so it's, it's just neat to see the variety. Yeah, and the lifesteal, you... A lot of people like to get that pretty early, at least the, the 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 original mask. And the reason being, he's obviously a great Roshan killer early on. If you can get a point or two into his E and get that uh, increased attack speed on Fervor. the same target, hmm? fervor. Yeah, fervor. Um, and then pop that ulti, of course, just with maybe another teammate there or something. He can even solo it with lifesteal, probably. Uh, you know, around the eight level nine, kind of like Ursa in the same similar sense. Um, but yeah, you get a couple of teammates in there, maybe even some with a medallion. Hell, that thing is burned down quick, and you know he's very effective at that. Um, of course, uh, when you do pop that ulti, you can deny. I don't confirm denies. I'm pretty sure though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I like to make the statement first, but and then maybe back it up after uh, that. It's similar to Pudge, where you just hear it on the map, even if you can't see what's going on. The sound effect. I'm pretty sure you hear that. Confirm-ish? Yeah, I think confirm that's a confirm-ish. -ish. We're, we're pretty-ish. Anyone want to leave a comment and prove us wrong, feel free. Or agree with us. We love both. More we love the agreeing part. But, uh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, in that regard, yeah, you might give away the road shot if you're like, what, what's that troll doing? Like, it, he's just going ham somewhere. But uh, but either way, uh, it's, a, it's a good time with that here. He's probably my favorite of the four that, that got introduced for sure, just because of his versatility and his pure strength he brings to his team. I, I love him for that. Yeah. Uh, I know there was something else you wanted to, to talk about, some other heroes. Well, speaking of, I guess, well, I mentioned Enchantress in the lineup. So, that segue. No, actually, it has nothing to do with that, but... Uh, Enchantress vs. Chen. I just wanted to briefly get some thoughts because I, I, I was kind of thinking about myself, especially when we were talking about drafting, and apparently when we're drinking as friends, we get into really deep Dota analytical discussions, which we should probably record or have like a secretary next time to really write down these thoughts. I'm a great coach. When From what I hear, when you, get, when you start drinking, mm -hmm. you really are a wonderful over-the-shoulder coach. I was very supportive <laughs> and comforting from what I remember. Uh... Very positive, good it's energy. Very, yeah, just like, no, you did that right there. That was really good, man. You just keep it up. You just, just do that. Do that. You missed some creeps there, but it's okay. I still love you, man. <laughs> As it got sloppier and sloppier, the, the, uh, the useful information became less frequent and less frequent. But uh, as long as you kept it positive, I guess that was the ultimate win. But uh, anyways, back to what I was saying. Uh, I was thinking about the differences of some drafting different lineups, and, uh, you know, a, a main one that comes up in my mind is when teams decide to go with the Chen versus the Enchantress in their lineup. Obviously, these heroes are very comparable. People like to go back and forth on which they should be used or which should be taken up, why you would pick one or the other. Um, so I just kind of wanted to just get in a brief little discussion. Obviously, you are... <laughs> You are the jungle player of our of our friends. There's no questioning that, um, especially the Chen and Chances where Micro is involved at any kind of level. Um, even though uh, one of our friends is starting to play Visage a little more, which is pretty nice. But uh, you very know, thankful for the job, Gino Beam. But uh, shout out to him. But yeah, so why don't you just quickly crack this open? Why 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 do you think teams would pick up one over the other? In what kind of cases? Me personally, I am really, really heavily leaning towards just liking Chen um, better in general. I mean, I think when we first started seeing both these heroes, at least for me personally, the big things, the big differences, well, Enchantress, she can push super, super early compared to Chen. Um, and she's like, she can gank really well too. And the, the Storm Harpy, I think the Storm Harpy might be the one place where she actually gets like just an advantage being able to take multiple creeps so early on you can actually send the storm harpy who has this really short cooldown really low mana cost per damage ability into a lane and you can pretty much help whoever's on your team win it flat out by just sending this harpy in um but now that i'm kind of getting to watch more and more the chens with the smokes are becoming just so strong i mean chen in general just has I want to say more than 10 point higher win rate than the Enchantress does um, in the professional scene. And just the fact that he's not only this powerhouse early on with the smokes, like I said, being able to put on pressure in the middle lane um, very early on, 
Um, and the fact that he transitions into this, you know, walking heel bot that has still plenty of um, crowd control to give between the centaurs and the troll warlords, he's able to um, troll chieftains that he's able to, to pick up from the jungle. M me, personally, I think you really have to have a, a really particular lineup if you want to make the Enchantress work really well. Obviously, she can put out a lot of damage to that Impetus, but I feel like if you're not getting a tower by minute three or four, then you might as well have gone for the Chen. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and like you've kind of pointed out, but uh, <coughs> Enchantress's uh, uh, enchant ability uh, shares the same cooldowns, 30 seconds or both. However, Enchantress's uh, last 80 seconds flat out, and so hypothetically she can have two and a half people in that duration. Now, yeah, granted, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you want the bottom half of the centaur so you can <laughs> stop. Go on. Yes, correct. Whereas Chen has to wait till level 5 to get his second minion. Um, unless he goes to the Dominator, but let's not get into that discussion. So, um, uh, hey, it could happen. Uh, just saying. Uh, TI4, believe. Anyways. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, obviously, Enchantress is going to have more of that, uh, pressure coming out from the minions early on, but late game is where they completely shift in different directions. Uh, like you're kind of saying, Enchantress goes into this kind of DPS-y mode with her, uh, her Impetus. Uh, you know, the Untouchable only helps when they're attacking her. Uh, the Wisps, you have to be next to your allies to help them out, and they have to take their time to heal things. I mean, it's not that quick, it's not that efficient. Uh, nothing like a Chen ulti. And uh, the Enchant, most people honestly even, I see a lot of pros leave it lower level. Uh, and just go for stats, just to go for more of a damage -y kind of roll, because honestly, all you're gaining is a shorter cooldown by 5 seconds and 10% more speed slow, which, at the end of the day, is usually not enough to make or break the fight. So, uh, I, I think I would agree with you in general, if I were to just want a, one or the other, I'd normally want a Chen on my lineup, just for the fact that he just brings so much to the table. They both have a slow, he has a nice nuke that just does pure damage, he can teleport people home, which... Uh, hello, that's the only kind of that ability in the whole game. So, pretty important there. Uh, and, you know, Dendi couldn't do his combo with Puppy if it didn't exist, just saying. So, uh, uh, and then the Hand of God. Uh, pretty much amazing, just for its global abilities and just how much it heals. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I really want to touch in there when you were saying, like, even leaving the enchant low, um, I mean, for me, that that's sort of the other fatal flaw with Enchantress is... If you can sit there and push, and there's not a whole lot pushing against you, then great. Oh man, Enchantress, so good. But, uh, a hero that's super, super fragile, really, throughout the whole game. Once you get the Aghanims, it's a lot better, but even if you try and go for like an early drums or something, she still feels really flimsy. And so, Nature's Attendance not being an instant heal, that's even another reason why you might like the, the Chen better, because even if you're able to get a quick drop on him, if he gets the chance to drop Hand of God, awesome. I mean, everybody got healed. Maybe it bought you some more time. If you survive somehow and pop Nature's Intendance, eh, you know, I mean, you could still die. You could still wind up not getting anything out of that. And just the fact that Untouchable is only good against auto attackers early game, that doesn't help you anyway. So if it's going to be the high nuke damage that's going to be able to help take you out early. So, you know, I mean, I'm not. I, this sounds like Enchantress bashing. It I, does. I really like her. <laughs> Um, I again with Impetus, especially with Troll Warlord, amazing, and with the Mask of Madness too. Oh yeah, is hilarious. It's almost like, well, she's gonna die anyway, so <laughs> let's just make her hit like a truck for the three seconds she's alive. Um, I I I think both are of course you know good useful heroes, but for me personally, I think nine times out of ten I'm going for the Chen. You know, unless you are really able to put up a line up together that's going to be able to take advantage of the early tower gold. It's not just that you're getting the tower, it's that you're able to take a tower and then aggressively ward so that you're cutting off sections of the map, you're starving out the enemy team, you're able to put a, together a quick mech on whoever's in your middle lane or even one of your supports so that you can keep a push going even longer. It's so you can get up your quick bloodstone on your mid timber saw because we like that now. It's it's got to be one of those things for me. I think it, Chen is a lot more stable a pick. He fits into the game pretty much at all points, whereas Enchantress is like about fulfilling this very particular time-based action, and then you have to sort of 
use that to make the rest of your game happen because you can't just say I'm playing Enchantress this game and I don't really care if it goes to 50 minutes let's just see what happens I don't think that really works once you get beyond the you know the pub level right yeah when you're getting the more coordinated things obviously on a pub level Honestly, I, I could go either way. You know, who knows how well that person can micro and <laughs> how they can play the hero. And then Enchantress might even be better just because it's kind of more of a an F fest, a cluster F, however you want to play with it, the letter F. And people are just going ham on each other with auto attacks. And then Chen, yeah, maybe not as well in the coordinated situation. But um, yeah, I, I think we've, uh, I think you laid it out very well, especially um, of where they kind of shine and where they kind of don't. Um, so in general. Uh, pretty interesting. And also, I guess the other way, and you saw about Healbot, Chen's very commonly, almost every game should go mech as their core. That's pretty legit. Whereas, Enchantress is very often just rush that Ognims. So they don't even go that mech. And now, she's really just going for that hardcore DPS. So she's not even really a central part of the team as Chen is. You know, it's, it's a very, very different role at that point. I, that's actually why I really like Urn on Enchantress too. Just because it's again also helping you solve that health problem and gives you some mana regen which is great um, and also gives you the potential to heal and help keep pushes going because that's another great part about the Chen and then you know beyond the mech once you get the Aghanim Scepter you're you know looking at a really short cooldown on the Hand of God 30 seconds um, so I, I think again it's just a, a fact for me that he's more stable throughout the course of the game and because he can put up early pressure and, and maybe you can even look at it from that point of view if Enchantress is about getting the, the early towers and of course she can also help get some early kills Chen can also help get some early kills so that tower gold the, the little bit of gold to everybody has to be really important because if, if you just need to win one lane then just, you can do Chen but I guess maybe it's about winning multiple lanes or just trying to s spread it out um, with the Enchantress. Indeed. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I think that's very well put through. Um, with these new heroes coming in, is that going to change some of the hero picks, you think, that are currently going on? Like, will, for example, uh, Troll Warlord mid affect who the other teams are really focusing on picking? Are they still going to be, like, kind of the same, very similar heroes they've been drafting regardless of these new heroes? I don't know if I foresee any big changes. I mean, mostly just because of, like, when we were talking about it earlier, um, how sort of these common heroes already are, are getting bolstered or sort of I'm looking at them differently, like with the Gyrocopter and the Abaddon and with the Naga Siren and the Elder Titan. Um, I think for the most part, these are all going to stay um, pretty similar. The, the one thing that I did find interesting was seeing Abaddon banned in the, the first uh, set of bands, which meant that both Io and Batrider made it through. So, kind of interesting. Don't know if it was just the captain's banning being like, you know what, let's force these through. Um, I just want one of them. It doesn't really matter to me which one. So, you know what, Abaddon's pretty good and they like him. Let's ban Abaddon. Or if it was, we really don't like Abaddon. So, we'll take him out and deal with the consequences. Wouldn't that be but crazy it's interesting if the Abaddon shield broke Lasso? That would be crazy. I'm glad it doesn't. But <laughs> just, I mean, that, that would are you be. Glad it doesn't. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I feel like it should not break lasso, as that is literally Bat Rider's bread and butter. That is his move. You know, if you take that mojo away from him, he's got nothing left, man. I mean, uh, I, I'm I'm fairly certain. And the re other reason I'm thinking is just because it goes through magic community. That I feel like it's just such a strong one of those bells that just does not break. But. I mean, if someone wants to prove me wrong, you know, feel free. <laughs> that's, that's that's the great thing about our cast is we literally do no science. There's not much science involved. There, it's, it's a lot of theory. Science. We lot just of theory. like to we like to point out the things that we don't do science on. <laughs> We're the thinkers. Um, <laughs> yes, we much like Fox News. Don't fact check. Oh, <laughs> and don't compare us to that. Okay. Yeah, I, that was I feel worse <laughs> about myself already. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think, I definitely don't think Abaddon, I th honestly, of all those four heroes, Elder Titan's the only one that really seems to have the most, like, grand, maybe Centaur, maybe those are the two that have the biggest scale, kind of like, 
uh, impacts on how the flow of the game is. Um, uh, and actually, center now and think about it is probably the most, just because of his ultimate. But um, you know, Troll Warlord, eh, he's just another one of those mids that's going to do some damage. Uh, and then, God knows, I can't even remember the other hero. Abaddon? This is the one we were just talking about two seconds ago? <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, he's just going to be another Omni Knight to me, so I, I don't see him being too devastating in games. But Yeah, a hero that's strong enough, I think exactly. it's great. But, you know, it's good to see them being picked and banned, like you were saying earlier in this cast. As long as, like, as long as these heroes are balanced enough to that point, then we're good to go. Yeah, I mean, I think we did pretty good here, my friend. Yeah, no. um, unless That's there's true. anything else you want to discuss, we've come kind of full circle. We did so very impressively. I guess we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up for this week. Like I said, you guys, um, we already have the next episode planned out. It's gonna be happening in the very near future. If I told you a date, it wouldn't happen then. So I'm gonna <laughs> not. Exactly. I'll just tell you soon, and you just get a surprise. It's like surprise Christmas. You just wake up one morning, there's an extra episode of Dota on demand. So keep your eyes out for that, and of course, keep playing Dota throughout the week. You can, uh, of course, find more about us at youtubecom Dota on demand, facebookcom Dota on demand. There's this whole Twitter thing going on. And so you're welcome to look for us there as well. But until the next episode, have fun playing at Dota.